you are watching the Fatu Network and I am Sajja Brito. You're welcome to this TFN exclusive. Today we are having an interview with political science lecturer and political pundit Esa Njai to discuss some of the recent happenings in the country. Esa, welcome to the Fatu Network once again. Thank you so much for having me. Right, let's dive right into it. This country has been experiencing a lot of things and all of them are happening at the same time. You know, ranging from people getting shot along the Fonye Casamas border, allegedly by Senegalese security forces who are stationed there, to the ever rising prices of basic commodities, you know, frequent protests against the government of the Gambia, and most recently, an alleged attempted foiled coup on the government where several members of the Gambia armed forces were arrested and uh, a prominent member of the opposition United Democratic Party in the person of Momodo Sabali. But first, let's talk about foreign security officials, you know, allegedly killing people on Gambian soil. And uh, some people tend to believe that the Gambia government somehow um, does not seem to take serious, you know, these frequent killings. Why do you think that is? Well, um, I think um, the happenings in the Fonyi region of the Gambia, um, you know, things happening there, this is, these are not, you know, um, new. Um, they started way back um, since Germany left this country because of also the, the uh, what I would call a blind loyalty that the people of Fonyi also have for Germany. But I think, um, <coughs> like what some people said, uh, the government seemed not to care much about what is happening in Fonyi. And I subscribe to this view um, because these are this, some of these incidents have been happening um, since it started way back in 2017. We all remember um, when Haruna Jata was um, killed. Sure, yeah. um, we all remember also um, the various incidents that happened to the point that people had to leave their communities in Fonyi um, to even come to Combo um, because of the insecurity, the rising insecurity in the region. Um, you know, even towards the local government. Uh, sorry, the national assembly election. The IEC was even contemplating whether they could hold, um, you know, they could um, they could have elections there because of the rising insecurity there. And most of the time, you know, we don't even see the government coming out to react uh, on some of these things. What we saw was that when um, the recent, you know, killings happened there, I think three people were killed and one was seriously injured. Um, the government came out to make a statement to distance. Um, you know, itself to say that, in fact, these are refugees. They yes. have, you know, refugee status, meaning they are not Gambians. Mm -hmm. But what we can say also is that these are people that are living on Gambian soil. They're yeah. living in Fonyi. I, I don't um, think their nationality really matters. It doesn't States. matter here yeah. because, you see, it's, it's also not about insecurity on the, in the Gambia, but it's also about sub-regional insecurity, okay. especially Senegambia, knowing that the Casamas conflict has been going on for 40 good years mm -hmm. um, this year. So um, the government really, I think, what is expected of them, instead of trying to distance themselves instead of trying to exonerate um, the Gambia from this. It's to see how best they can collaborate with the Senegalese authorities um, to see how they can address this issue. Because um, these are people that are living on Gambian soil and if they go out there, they are you know, being killed by allegedly by Senegalese um, yeah. forces. Um, what we can also link this to is to the, is to the, the high presence of um, Senegalese forces um, in Fonyi. Yeah. Um, we know that they're present in, in Boyam, you know, around the around Fonyi area um, in the name of economic mission in the Gambia. Yeah. And I think this is a security issue. I've raised this on many um, interviews um, that I think the government really needs to work on this. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having Ghanaians or Nigerian securities or um, economic forces um, in Fonyi because we know that Senegal has a vested interest um, in Fonyi, knowing fully well that the Kazamans conflict has been going on. So the Gambia could be used as a launch pad um, by Senegalese forces to you know, do their fight with the MFDC. So I think the Gambia needs to be very cautious. And I've said this um, in the past during Jamez time, it used to be um, Senegal, the Senegalese government being suspicious um, that the Gambia is, was aiding the MFDC. Yeah. But now the suspicion has shifted mm -hmm. um, from, you know, from, from Dakar to now to Kazamas. It's the MFDC that is now suspicious that the Gambia government it's aided is aiding the government, the, of the, the government of Senegal to fight the MFDC. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be very cautious um, as to how we fare um, fair in this conflict uh, because it has been going on and we have been an actor in the conflict, either directly or indirectly. 
Um, and we have the potential to be a mediating force in this conflict. But instead, that is not happening. It's one of the sides um, at a time will be suspicious that we are um, actually you know, aiding um, the other side. And I think that is really um, serious um, as far as our security, our fragile security situation right now is concerned. Yeah. So we have seen several protests against this Baro government. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say that, well, it is okay for people to hold protests because it is healthy for our democracy. On the other hand, we have seen protesters get, you know, um, physically assaulted. We have seen protesters get intimidated, you know. And um, now, um, you know, recently we've also seen a another protest where people came out to, mm -hmm. to um, protest against the detention of um, Mumudu Sabali. Mm -hmm. And the security forces were there, even though the people who were out were not many, mm -hmm. the police had to use tear gas on them to disperse the crowd. The question is, do you think this government cares about democracy uh, uh, as much as they, they like to portray? Well, I've, I've said this um, recently that um, the Gambia, it seems we have not taken a complete departure from the uh, Jami era. Um, the bad laws that have been in this country since the Jami era um, are still here. Um, if you look at the Public Order Act, well, it's a colonial law. It was used by the colonialists to oppress and suppress our people. Um, when Jawara came, he maintained it. When Yajame came, he maintained it. And under President Baro, too, it is still here. Um, it's a law because it's, a, it's here because, you know, it seeks to protect the regime um, against, you know, dissatisfaction um, that might come from the, from the citizenry. And the regime uses it to its convenience. Um, so it's rather unfortunate we have this law. So meaning we have not taken a complete departure from the Yajame era. Um, the difference between... Baro and Jame when it comes to, because I've always made an analysis to say, mm -hmm. at least when it comes to civil and political rights, um, it, Baro's government is better than Jame. But it seems like, um, you know, things are changing. The dynamics are changing in the sense that um, under Jame, he will not even give you the platform. Yeah. You will not give you the opportunity. You don't have the opportunity to speak. But under Barrow, the opportunity is given to you. You have, you know, your freedom to talk. Mm -hmm. But freedom, after, after expressing your opinion, um, there is no guarantee that you will be safe. Um, what is happening is um, people are being arrested. We saw this started way back in 2018, January, when Dr. Sisi was arrested. We saw the Madi Jobates, the Nene Fredas, the, you know, Yusuf Taylors. You know, we saw now the Sabalis. I mean, people are being arrested um, frequently um, for merely expressing their opinions. Um, and the government, so it's, the government, you know, I mean, this, this tells us that there's something fundamentally wrong. Um, with you know the Gambia when it comes to um, respecting the rule of law, but also it's not only about the frequent arrests, but the blatant violation of the law. Um, is, is, is you know this is something that we are witnessing um, under the present government in the sense that we have seen what um, the High Court order or the ruling that had been made in the case of um, Nene Freda and the government blatantly um, flouted that. Um, we've also seen the arrest of Mumudu Sabali extending his detention, which is also um, in violation of the Constitution. So when it comes to respecting um, fundamental rights and freedoms, um, this government so, has so no difference. And I've said this repeatedly, um, that, you see, when it comes to protests, um, Sajo, this is, a, this is an issue in the Gambia, and people, it's time that we speak to our people, especially those in authorities, for them to understand one thing. You see, um, there is a cost for democracy. Democracy, once we choose di um, democracy over dictatorship, we must be um, ready to, um, uh, you know, take whatever it comes with in terms of respecting people's fundamental rights and freedoms. And when it comes to protest, I've all, this is always my view, that the law which says that people still take permit, for instance, um, the Public Order Act, is bad. For me, it should not exist in a civilized and democratic society. Um, there is no progressive democratic society where people should apply for permit um, to stage a protest. This is an exercise of fundamental right. See, if I am exercising my right to vote, for instance, which is a fundamental right, I don't take permit from the state. As long as I'm legally qualified, I'm an eligible voter, I have to go and vote. I, the state does not have to be, give me approval to say, no, Sajo or Esa, you cannot vote. Yeah. Okay? When I'm expressing my opinions in the media, I don't get approval from the state. So when I'm exercising my fundamental right, which is freedom of expression and assembly, 
the state should not give me approval. Mm -hmm. What should happen is that because in exercising your right, you might also encroach on the rights of others. That's mm -hmm. why we say where somebody's rights end, that is where and somebody else's rights begin. begin. Right. So in the exercise of my fundamental right to freedom of expression and assembly, I can notify the state. I should notify the state. Mm -hmm. Because in this case, when I'm going to vote, I'm not necessarily encroaching on the rights of others. When I'm expressing my views in the media, I'm not necessarily encroaching on the rights of others. But when I'm exercising my right to protest, I might encroach on the rights of others. Because if I go to Westfield today, rush hour, I occupy there with my people, mm -hmm. I will also be encroaching on the rights. Yeah, yes. exactly, because people also have right to get to their homes. Yeah. So the state can regulate that you apply, you, you notify the state to say, well, I want to stage a protest. I'm angry with the with Navek. They can tell me that, well, if it's Navek, go to Navek headquarters. Mm -hmm. If you want to use your sphere, we can give you a particular time, but we can't give you um, rush hour time because people also have to get their houses. So the state will have to provide security to say, well, um, this and this particular time we're giving you, but here is a security for your own protection, but to also make sure that others are protected and they also go about with their normal business. But mostly what we are seeing in this country is that when people apply for permit to state protest, they will even tell them that, look, if anything goes wrong, you'll be held responsible. It is not the responsibility of the citizens to promote or maintain law and order. It is the responsibility of the state, the primary responsibility of the state as a duty bearer to maintain law and order. So if I am staging a protest, Sadio comes there with an ulterior motive, mm -hmm. you know, the state has to deal with Sadio. It's not my responsibility to take care of, you know, whatever goes on there. So the state must understand that this is a fundamental right and they have to allow people to express themselves freely. So the Public Order Act is something that um, the National Assembly should look into. Mm -hmm. um, we are in a democratic society. We should not be applying for permit to get approval from the state to state protest. Um, and that is why they will always, most of the time, most of the time what happens is that when you have pro-government protests, they will never deny them permits. But when it's anti-government protests, you will deny, they, they will deny them permits. And when it comes to police brutality, it is really unfortunate and it shows something that there is something fundamentally wrong with our security sector reform. We are six years or seven years into this government. Um, the security sector reform, if, if, if the, the behavior of our security force, we say particularly the paramilitary unit, I've always said that the, the police force, the government police force has become the new NIA and the PIU has become the new junglers. I mean, if, if the behavior that was here since the Jame time is the same behavior that we have coming from our paramilitary forces, our security forces, then our security sector reform has not gone anywhere. There's something fundamentally wrong with it because security sector reform is supposed to instill that sense of professionalism, those democratic values and principles and standards in the members of our security sector. And of course, to make sure that the security sector is subjected um, to you know, civilian control and management and of course democratic accountability. But these things are not happening. What we are seeing is that security forces are used. I mean, just like what happened yesterday, I saw it. These people are, were not armed. You can't go to protesters that were even less than 50. I mean, the first thing you, you, you do is to throw tear gas, I, to open tear gas. Like, I, don't, I don't just get it. It shows that something is wrong. And PIU officer, it shows the Gambia also we are not learning or we have not learned from even the TRRC. I mean, people were here telling us that, well, they were showing remorse, we regretted, these were beyond us. The same things are happening now. I mean, tomorrow too, are they going to sit before another TRRC and say, we regretted this, we could not do anything? You have the option. And PIU officers must be very careful with how they deal with the people. These are your own brothers and sisters. When public officials loot state resources, they share them amongst themselves. They don't even think of you. They steal our resources and share it amongst themselves. They are the ones that are enjoying their rich I mean, but you as security officers, what is your salary? You're receiving chicken change at the end of every month. Even to buy a bag of rice is a problem for you. And when they want to brutalize, when the state want to brutalize you, their own citizens, that is when they use you. So, and I think, you know, they should be able to learn from what happened here in the past. Tomorrow, there could be accountability. Government is temporary. The state is permanent. You are in a uniform. When you are in a uniform, you are not representing the government. Yeah. You are representing the state. And it is those people that made up the state. If you look at the 1933 Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States, one fundamental criterion for a state to exist is the people, the permanent population. If the people are not there, there is no state. So people, security officers must understand that, look, when people are out to protest, to express their dissatisfaction, even if they don't have a permit, you don't have any right to throw tear gas as long as they are not even violent, especially when they are not using violence. Yeah. So these are people that are not armed. 
They are your brothers and sisters. They are Gambians just like you. Um, you cannot just go out there and throw tear gas at them. I think that is um, something that is that is really wrong. And the government, um, just under Jame, we used to have what we call regime security. And it's the same thing. And regime security, when the government prioritizes regime security um, over public security, then you know this is where fun, uh, uh, human rights violations occur by members of the security forces, and that will warrant the security sector reform. Um, so under the present dispensation, what we expect is that security forces should be um, the custodians of the law, that is the part of the executive, they execute the law to and so on, yeah. that law and order is expect, respected. And I always say this, that look, it is normal for citizens to violate the law because the law is there for us. We are human beings, we can violate the law, but we don't expect the state to violate the law. The state should ensure that because it is the custodian, that is the government is the custodian of the law, it should make sure that laws are respected. If people violate the law, deal with them according to the law. But using excessive force against citizens, especially when they are not armed, is really that is against democratic standards and values. And now perhaps to the biggest headline um, for the past week in and now, uh, the attempted fault coup. Um, I know that Africa, Gambia to be specific, has gone through a lot of coups in the past and attempted foiled coups at, as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you, you, you teach you know, peace and security at the, at the University of the Gambia. Mm -hmm. Generally, you, you deal with political science. But in your opinion, mm -hmm. why, what do you think inside coups in Africa? What could be the factors? So coup, coup, coup is something, especially in West Africa. You see, um, from independence um, in 1960, a lot of African countries, let's do a bit of history. A lot of African countries um, have experienced military coup. Yeah. Gambia, you know, fortunately for us, we were an exception. Um, together with Senegal, together with, um, with countries like Botswana, mm -hmm. and of course, um, you know, Mauritius, we were in fact um, regarded as the, um, the bastion of democracy when it comes to multi-party democracy on the continent. But, um, you know, if you look at the 60s in Ghana, you know, Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown in 1966. The Malis, the Modibo Keters, a lot of African countries experienced military coup. Mm -hmm. It was only in 1981. In fact, ours was not even a military coup. Mm -hmm. um, it was a coup that was, you know, staged or led by, um, it was a foil one anyway, led by civilians, um, Kukwe Sambasanyang, we all know, in 81. It was only in 1994 that we had a successful military coup. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you look at Africa, I mean, West Africa has now become the home of military coups. Mm -hmm. um, just um, last year, yeah, last year, um, there was a, there's a security, I mean, Ghanaian security expert who said that West Africa would likely experience, this was, um, two, I think this was in October, when he said that West Africa will likely experience two more military coups. And before the end of the year, we experienced one. But um, he, I mean, he might, there might not have been two military coups, but I think um, early, early, early 2022, we had another military coup. Mm. So um, West Africa has recently become the home of military coups in Guinea, in Mali, in Burkina Faso. And of course, uh, recently, I mean, government came out to say in Gambia too. And if you look at the coups, why coups take place? Um, what are the factors that, you know, sometimes um, lead to coup, military coup d'etat? Um, there is what we call typologies of coups, you know, types of coups where military coups take place. One of them is called um, veto coup. Veto, if you understand the word veto, is when somebody use um, their powers or their whatever to protect their own interests. Like yeah. we have the Security Council veto powers that they have. Mm -hmm. Russia or America or UK or France or China can use their veto powers to protect their own interests. Mm -hmm. So veto coup happens when the military feels like certain sociopolitical changes, um, you know, is against um, their interests or threatens their interests. <coughs> that is when the military feels like maybe probably it has to do with their welfare, yeah. um, they are not being properly taken care of, mm -hmm. or maybe the security of the country is not even in their hands, foreign forces are in the country, they are taking, I mean, they've taken charge of the security of the country. Mm -hmm. So they feel like they are not relevant anymore, yeah. they're not even, um, they're redundant, they're not doing their job or their welfare is not taken. That is when the military um, comes in and we call that a veto coup. But there is also another type of coup called a guardian coup. A guardian coup, just like the word guard, you know, right. when the military feels like they have a moral um, obligation responsibility, to, obligation, exactly, yeah. to guard the civilian population, mm -hmm. um, to rescue them from an inept and a corrupt government. And if you look at, you know, coup d'etats that take place, even in the Gambia, 1994, if you listen to um, the military, when they came in 94, they were talking about what rampant corruption. Right. 
you know, um, lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. And these were the principles according to them that they came to promote. Mm -hmm. So coups can take place when there is rampant corruption in the country, there's economic hardship in the country, um, there is um, high cost of living, and, you know, and, and there is the presence of an inept government. Um, this can warrant a coup, and this is what we call a guardian coup. Remember when Sana Sabali went to the TRRC when he testified, he said, I mean, they, they felt like they, have, they had a moral responsibility to rescue Gambian people from the corrupt government of Dauda Jawara. So that's what we call a guardian coup. Yeah. But also, we could see an element of a veto coup in that coup as well, because they were also talking about the presence of um, Nigerian forces, forces who were closer country. to the presidency. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's the, Gambia 19, the 1994 coup in the Gambia, one could say, was a mixture of a veto and a guardian, guardian coup. Because coup. on the one hand, the military was trying to protect its interests because they felt that they were not prop, um, fairly treated by the government. But also on the other hand, they were trying to say that they wanted to rescue the civilian population. That's why they came with the slogan of you know, promoting accountability, mm -hmm. transparency and probity. And they were saying that they were soldiers with a difference. They were just coming to you know, normalize the situation and then they go back to the barracks. So, but then there is another type also, another th a third one for that matter, um, that the military can stage a coup when, I mean, what we call a breakthrough coup when we have a long-standing authoritarian regime in power, mm -hmm. um, like it happened in Ethiopia when Emperor Haile Selassie was um, ousted, um, you know, in 19, I think 1974, when he was, was removed from power. Um, I can't remember the exact year, but I think in the 1970s anyway. But he, was, he had been in power for almost 42 years. Um, because he had been in power for so long, they had to um, remove him from power um, and replace with another, with another government. So when there is a long-standing authoritarian regime in power mm -hmm. and the military feels like, look, you know, elections cannot remove this one, yeah. um, and also maybe not even popular uprising. The military feels like the only solution to this um, is for us to stage a coup, and that can lead to a coup. So if you look at the government situation, um, the attempted coup, um, I mean, whether it was an attempted coup or a which plot. Which is the next point I want to get to, <laughs> yeah. because I feel like at this point a lot of people are lost, mm -hmm. because one minute... I think this uh, attempted foiled coup has been mad with a, it has been shrouded mm -hmm. with a lot of mystery and contradictions mm -hmm. at least based on the you know the different press releases and information out there because one minute we are saying alleged next meeting I mean, I mean next minute we are saying attempted next minute we are calling it a plot I don't know which, which is which. In your opinion, what, what do you think is happening here, in your expert opinion? So um, what we saw was that, in fact, um, let's start with even the army itself. I think yes. Alcamba Times um, you know, published something when yeah. they heard of this rumor. Um, they contacted the deputy PRO mm -hmm. of the Gambia Armed Forces, who I think was the deputy or the PRO. I can't, I mean, I don't know by exactly, but I think it's the deputy PRO who said that they are not aware of any coup. Now, later what came out I was... I said something to the effect of there was some drill, sort of military drill exercise, drilling happening, yeah, exactly, drilling exercise happening. Exactly. So, yes. But later the following day, uh, you know, hours later, mm -hmm. the government came out with a statement to say um, that, you know, the first release that they made was, in fact, based on intelligence reports that they gathered, um, some soldiers were plotting. And I underline this word, were plotting, based on intelligence report that they gathered. Mm -hmm. um, some soldiers were plotting to overthrow the democratic electoral government of the um, Adam Abaro. So, yes. now it begs the question, was it a plot or an attempt? Attempt. Because, because I think we have to break it down. Yeah. Because if you plot something, mm -hmm. it's like, as I we just sit here and talk about it, oh, I'm mm -hmm. going to do a coup, you know, mm -hmm. I, I want to overthrow this government, mm -hmm. you know. But when you attempt, mm -hmm. it means that, you know, you're on the act now. You, you are, you are on the act yeah. now. So, so, so the plotting here will be if you and I, as probably military officers, we sit down and start discussing. Myself, you, Mansoor, Modu, Matar, we start discussing. Look, um, you know, we have to remove this government. I mean, how do we go about with this? Okay, well, I'm a captain. I have command. I have people, I mean, men under me. Mm -hmm. I can talk to them. What we're going to do is that let's get, you know, the keys to the armories. I mean, let's get the, the president arrested. Maybe he's traveling to outside the Gambia. I mean, um, let's get him arrested at the airport or whatever. Do you understand? Let's get the communication center blocked and all that. I don't want to go into this before they think yeah, that. Yeah, before they think they're trying to encourage, you know, yeah. they're trying to encourage. But, but I mean, I these, are, these are how coups take place. Anyway, yes. we know how they are done mostly. So that becomes a plot because you're just talking about it. That's the plan. You're just plotting mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. But the attempt will be now when we start, look, we start getting keys to the armories. We start controlling, yeah. commanding men under us to say, well, you have to get the airport. 
um, to make sure that the president, once he's there, he's arrested. Um, somebody has to get to the radio station and all that. It's that a becomes good thing an you, Yes, it's a good thing you mentioned the airport because as soon as I had information about this, I tried to reach out to someone who's an ex-military man. He's mm. in the UK now. Mm. And he was like, I literally left the Gambia yesterday. I'm just arriving, mm. you know, and you just called me. And I was at the airport and there was no <coughs> action happening inside. Mm -hmm. He was like, this is the most a strategic place that you need to yeah. make sure that, you know, you, you have control of when you are attempting a coup. Exactly. Again, we are not trying to, you know, encourage or, or explain to you how coups are done. But we're no, just no, but the, the guys in uniform know how it is done. Anyway. Yes, they exactly. know it better than Ex us. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so, so it, I mean, that becomes the attempt. When you try to carry out the exercise the act, itself, yes, the act yes. itself, it becomes an attempt. And when it fails, we call it a fail coup um, or a fail attempted coup. Yeah. So, um, so the government press release was telling us that there was a plot. Yeah. And this plot is not that, in fact, the government had carried out an investigation to affirm this. No. It was based on intelligence reports that they gathered, meaning yeah. they're relying on just Sajo and Matar and, you know, Mansur coming as intelligence officers of the, either the army or probably the NIA coming to tell us that, look, the government that, look, Esa and Modu are trying to overthrow. Yes. That is the plan. They've been talking about this. And they based it on that and just arrested us. So that is what the press release is telling us, that actually there was no attempted coup. Yeah. What we had was plot that they received information, intelligence information or report that some members of the Gambia Armed Forces were trying to overthrow the democratically elected government of um, Baro. And that is what has generated a lot of controversy because when people saw it earlier, um, and I think, I mean, a lot of people believed in it like it was an attempted coup without even yeah. properly reading um, the statement itself in entirety to yeah. digest it properly, to analyze it and look at it from a critical lens. Mm -hmm. And now what we saw, what is so also um, strange about it, the whole thing is, um, you know, the army is not even coming out to make statements. It's the government spokesperson that is coming out to make statements. So, I mean, I think also there was, I mean, there could have been, you know, collaboration between the Office of the Government Spokesperson and, and then the, the Army. army yes. I mean, even the choice of word, the language to use. Mm -hmm. I mean, because some people, when you talk to some people um, who are they're probably former military officers, they will tell you that this could be seen as mutiny without violence and not necessarily an attempted coup. So probably these are dis just disgruntled officers in the Army. Mm -hmm. But also we're seeing or hearing reports, family members of the um, alleged plotters coming out to deny the involvement of their loved ones in the alleged coup. Let's talk about, you know, the kind of people who have been arrested so far and their ranks within the army. I am no military person, you are not. Mm. But um, if you speak to military people, they will tell you, I mean, who are these people in the army? Mm. Because their positions in the army do not really give them the power to be able to, you know, overthrow a government. They will tell you, you know, you need to have some sort of command, <coughs> you know, to be able to carry out, you know, certain, certain acts. Mm. And, and people also are beginning to think that this whole thing is staged. Yeah. What, what is your opinion on that? Yeah. I, I don't think we can go so low to, to stage something as, as dangerous as this. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the ringleader himself, the alleged ringleader himself, um, according to the government press release, um, is a land corporal. And when you talk to some military officers, to ex-military officers, they will tell you that, well, a land corporal cannot, cannot lead a coup because he or she has no... Um, men under their control. They don't have any men under their control. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have that command role yeah. or responsibility as a result they're going to get. And if you want to stage a coup, obviously you must have people under your command. Yeah. That's why the 94 coup was successful because Jame, you know, Sanasabali, mm -hmm. you know, Edward, you know, they were all um, lieutenants at the time when they were staging the coup. So they had, you know, I mean, people under their control, men under their control that could do the job for them. Uh, because you cannot do this job alone. Just five or six people cannot do this job alone. So you need people to help you. Um, so it, it was a lance corporal from the Gambia Navy. Yeah. And also another one was also, is also a lance corporal, a lance corporal, I think, from the Gambia Navy. Then just yesterday, um, we saw another release saying that um, a captain yes. and a lieutenant are being arrested right. um, in connection with the coup. Um, I don't know. Some people will say, well, I think the government is trying to validate their claim that I'm... Um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, because people are saying that these are low-ranking officers. Yeah. How can they lead a coup? Mm -hmm. Now, getting captains and lieutenant involved, people will start to believe that well, it could be there could be a modicum of truth. But yeah. again, I think it's putting the government in more trouble because mm -hmm. how can a lance corporal lead a coup that involves a captain and a lieutenant? Okay, a lance corporal leading a coup 
being the ringleader of a coup where you have a captain and a lieutenant um, that is unimaginable. So it, it begs, I mean, the press releases that are coming out in bit, um, um, I think they're raising more questions yeah, um, than providing answers to yeah. the population as to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And now let's talk about um, the role of the former president, Yahya Jami, in this whole thing. Because soon as um, there was a coup, uh, a lot of people started saying that, well, people like Jami should not be given a platform to even speak to the Gambian people because this happened just days mm -hmm. after his um, 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 meeting in, in El Arar where he said that he was going to come back and, and be the president of this country again. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people tried to link him to this saying that, you know, his, his um, utterances might have instigated this attack. What, is your, what do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I've said this in an, in an interview, a previous interview <coughs> with the media house that... Um, there could, people could draw connection um, between Jamia's utterances and, and, the, and the foil coup or the plot um, in the sense that Jamia spoke on a Saturday um, to his um, supporters in URR um, just 72 hours later. Saturday, Monday, um, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, 72 hours later exactly, mm -hmm. you know, there was a, a report by the government to say that, you know, people were plotting, some members of the armed forces were plotting yeah. to remove the government. So. Because Jame was speaking very confidently that he will come back to this country and rule <laughs> again. Um, no human being or no gene can stop him. So we try to draw the connection. But mm -hmm. it shows one thing. For me, um, Jame's remarks shows the megalomaniac tendency in him. His um, desire and obsession for power um, and to remain relevant in Gambian politics um, since leaving the country. Because here is a man who was ruling for 22 years, used to power and privileges and enjoyments and all that. And now for five, six, seven years, you're not relevant no more. Um, he wants to keep that relevance in Gambian politics. His supporters will also, not agree with you because they think he's still very much relevant in Gambian yeah, um, politics. That, that's what I'm saying. I mean, he, he wants to keep that relevance. Um, if Jame was relevant in Gambian politics, probably um, he would have, you know, um, you know, influenced the outcome of the December you know, 2021 presidential election. election. Um, he did not support the incumbent, and the incumbent was able to win. Mm -hmm. uh, what we can see is that Jame is relevant still in politics in Fony. We can see Fony politics because he has a large followers, because, and also he was able to influence the outcome of the parliamentary elections. elections yeah. You know, when, um, of course, um, you know, uh, the, the NAM, the Known Alliance Movement won, but also even Kande in the presidential election won in Fony. Mm -hmm. So Jame is relevant in Fony politics. But looking at broadly, Gambian politics, I don't think he's relevant. But also, if you, if the reason why Jame is still talking, well, one could argue that, well, he's still relevant because he's still talking. And he has people that are listening to him. Yeah. So, I mean, with that, you could question why. Why is Jame still talking? Um, I've, just recently, I had a, a youth um, nominated member of parliament um, saying that um, the non-alliance movement people should be arrested for... Um, allowing or giving uh, Jame the platform to speak. speak yeah. But I think also um, we have to go back. Uh, we, our memories cannot be short. Um, it was just, you know, shortly before the December election that, you know, you know Jame, uh, President Barrow attempted to go to bed with Jame, that is to the bromance we saw, mm -hmm. um, to go into alliance with him. And of course, that tells us that if Barrow had it his way, you know, Jame would have been probably more relevant an active in Gambian politics today because probably he would have been forgiven. And we saw just last week, Tom Bonjata said this in their Congress that they cooked everything. Mm -hmm. You know, everything was ready just for Jame to come back to this country. They did all the negotiations with Barrow and everything was ready. And Jame came and spoiled everything. Uh, if so, we have to go back to um, even when President Barrow tried to have an alliance with, with President Jame's APRC, Tom mm -hmm. Mongjata said that we had the blessing of President, of President Jame before President we got Jame. into So this. meaning, yes. Barrow knew exactly what was going on. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, um, you know, it's important now for us to start talking about Jame talking in Gambian politics. Let's allow him to talk as much as he can. You know, if the Gambia government is really interested in prosecuting uh, Jame or taking legal action against Jame, they should start that process. But the international community also might have an interest to, you know, prosecute uh, Jame because the alleged crimes that he committed are of international character. So for me, 
I think um, the JAME discussion should, should, be, should be a thing of the past, that we need to focus on a lot of serious issues mm -hmm. than actually talking about whether JAME said this or what he said here, here and there. Yeah. And, and while we are talking about um, coups and since members of you know, the, the Gambia Armed Forces, some members of the Gambia Armed Forces have already been arrested, another person who has already also been in police um, custody is um, <coughs> Momodo Sabali, who is a prominent member of the opposition, United Democratic Party. I think he's been held now for almost um, seven days. What do you make of this? Because some people think that it is, this is nothing but political. Well, um, if you look at the whole scenario, um, Mamadou Sabali is a politician. Um, we all know, um, especially recently being elected as the, I mean, not elected, mm -hmm. but um, chosen. I don't know because it was not an election, but chosen as the um, you know, campaign, campaign manager, manager, the campaign mm -hmm. manager of the opposition UDP. Mm -hmm. um, of course, his utterances um, make saying that we will take the government mm -hmm from Adam Obaro, even before the local government elections. In my view, it's a political statement. He's a politician um, who can say those things. But if the state feels like um, the, the, the suspicion, there is reasonable suspicion mm -hmm. um, that you know, his statement um, could have another connotation or meaning, they arrested him, fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nobody has a qualms with that. Arrest mm -hmm. him, but the constitution is very clear on that. You keep somebody, not more than 72, 72 hours, hours, you have yeah. to let the person know what crimes he has committed mm -hmm. and you know, bring the person before a competent court of law. But that has not happened here. What we saw was the state applying an ex expatriate motion yeah. Um, to keep him for extra 10 days. And we know that in, in, in January when Sol Baji and others were arrested when they came back, um, there was an expatriate motion that was also um, applied yeah. and the court ruled that, look, in February that you can't keep these people beyond 72 hours. That would be a violation of the constitution. Um, the state has applied for this and they have, the judge had decided to extend. I cannot just imagine and many legal luminaries that you talk to will tell you that the judge got it all wrong. I don't know why he did that because for me, and I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but yeah. this is common sense. Mm -hmm. The law is very clear. The constitution is say, saying um, 72 hours. And the constitution in line with section 4 is saying that the constitution is the supreme law of the land. There are other laws in the country, but any of those laws that is found to be inconsistent with any of the provisions of this constitution mm -hmm. shall be declared null and void. So no court, no judge, um, no law. Can, 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 can overrule what the constitution says. If you keep Mamadou Sabari fine two days or three days, you keep him there. Um, I, I, as, as far as we know, and even the state, yeah. Sabari has not committed any crime for now because they have not pressed any charges against him. Yes. As, long as, as far as we know, and as far as even the state is concerned, Sabari has not committed any crime. Okay, so the argument that is politically motivated, I want to believe in this because he's a politician and his statement, you know, is, is a political statement. It's within the context of politics, especially saying that before the local government election, um, especially, I mean, talking about the countering of information and all that and this other. I think this is just the, I mean, normal, you know, um, you know confrontation, political confrontation between yeah. um, political parties, especially the UDP and NPP as the two biggest political parties in the country. Of course, NPP as the biggest and the UDP being the second biggest, it's normal for them to have that. So I think the state also needs to be very cautious of that, um, especially in, when it comes to violating law. And you know, there's this argument that a lot of people put out there that yeah. really, Sadio, I want to talk about. It's important that um, people are mindful of you know, things that they say. You see, Sabali is victim today because this whole thing started in 2017. And that's why Gambians need to be very honest with themselves. When you are not affected by something, you seem not to care. When Dr. Cesar was arrested in 2018, um, I remember there were a lot of people that were celebrating it, um, insulting him, calling him names and all that because they were not affected. Yeah. It was just only few people, um, you know, the Buba Sananjais, the Omar Saibos, you know, the Basiru Sises, few of them that went to um, the police headquarters in Bajul and spent the night there. But that was the beginning of assault on the Gambian people, and Gambians should not have accepted that. When Madi Jobati was arrested, some people celebrating, it's only a few people that went to, to fight. For me, it's not about standing for them, it's about standing for what is right and against what is wrong. Now, Sabal is the victim. There are people who are not also bothered, they're celebrating it because they're not affected. Yeah. Tomorrow you could be the victim of, of the same injustice mm -hmm. um, that is happening in the country. And when people say that, well, Sabali was part of government in Baro and Jammes time, you know, people had their rights being violated and all that not. Mm -hmm. See, if anybody has their issues with anybody who condone Jame brutalities in this country, I am number one. I will continue to condemn yeah, Jame's brutality for the rest of my life. And anybody who condone Jame brutality, I will continue to condemn you. But look, 
The very reason why we changed government in 2016 was to have the rights of every Gambian respected yes, in this country. Yes. Regard, regardless of whether you wear a Jami enabler or not, we don't care about that. Even a Jami of all people, if he comes back to this country, we will respect his rights. What we expect is that his fundamental rights will be respected. If you're going to try him, bring him before a competent court of law, do that you know, to ensure that he has a um, fair trial. That's what we expect. So. You know, we did not change government to say, oh, because Tom Bonjata was in Jamie's government. No, we should not have his rights respected. We did not change government to say, oh, because Sabali was there, his rights will not be respected. Oh, Rambo was there. No, we changed government to ensure even the freedom of expression. Yeah. We did not change government to say, oh, you know, it's only Esanja who can talk because he was not working in Jamie's government. Therefore, Tom Bonjata cannot talk. No. Tom Bonjata, when they were in, I mean, before the alliance with, with Barrow, they said a lot of things here. And people respected that. Yeah. People must understand that there are consequences, like I said, when you choose democracy over dictatorship. Sometimes it might hurt. Mm -hmm. Somebody speaking might hurt you, but you don't have any choice. You have to bear that because that is what democracy comes with. Mm -hmm. So we change government to ensure that the rights of all are respected. If it is about people being enablers, or oh, Saban is enabler, then we don't care. But how about Tom Banjada? Okay, Tom Banjada is the top in command in this country. I mean, Sidin Jai is, um, uh, you know, um, deputy speaker. You have the Lamin Queen Jamis. You have the Sirif Abbasanians. You have the Lami, um, the the, um, the Momodu Tangaras. You have the Mamburin Jais. All these people work in Jamis government. Yeah. Therefore, we can also say the Rambos who are now in foreign service, the Fatma Rajahum Pasises in foreign service. We can also say that look, these people worked in Jamia's government, they are enablers. We know that Tom Bonjata was the one who led the passing of the, the sta um, state of emergency in this country. Mm -hmm. Sidin Jai was uh, stood by uh, Jamia to the last minute, to the point that he was just a 90s minister, saying that Jamia will not leave this country and Barrow will not be sworn in in this country. We saw how Fatma de Jahumpa Sisi, the Rambos, how they all stood by Jamia. You know, Sidif Abbasanya was Queen even an MP. To make him Queen a king. king. Queen Jamia. Yes. All these people were here. I mean, and abated the dictator for 22 years. Good year. So, I mean, it's not right for people to say, oh, because Sabali was... What we, it's not, this is not about Sabali, like I said. Mm -hmm. This is about standing for what is right mm -hmm. and standing against what is wrong. Even if Sab, Let's assume that, because like I said, the mm -hmm. state has not come out in any charges against Sabali. Therefore, we are saying that Sabali has not committed any crime. But let's assume that Sabali has committed crime. Even if he had said, okay, Gambian people rise up with arms against the government. Even if he had said that. Now... That is fine for the state to come and arrest, the police to arrest. Mm -hmm. But the law is very clear. Don't go beyond 72 hours. Without if you go beyond them. that, exactly, yeah. then you are violating the law. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, citizens can violate law. That is normal. Mm -hmm. But it's abnormal for the state to violate law. The state is the custodian of the law. The state should ensure that laws are respected, especially when it comes to the supremacy of the Constitution. That is the stage that we are in right now. And I think what the state should do um, is to ensure that the rights of everyone is respected, including Mr. Sabali. Um, he has not committed any crime as we speak because no charges have been pressed against him. Mm -hmm. um, what is happening is that um, he's having his fundamental rights being violated and Barrow's government claimed to be the champion of freedom of expression, claimed to be the champion of democracy and respect for fundamental rights and freedoms. But I think the dynamics are changing. Gambia is really, if we are not very cautious, will be um, slipping back into dictatorship. And, and finally, um, if you followed the protest yesterday, I don't know if you listened to the protest group speak, because what they are trying to say, they're basically accusing the Attorney General's chamber of plotting to, to charge Sabali um, with treason. I mean, if that happens to be the case, I mean, what do you think about that? Well, I think that would be very unfortunate because the Attorney General himself, I must say that um, I must register my biggest disappointment with his actions um, because he's the legal advisor to the government. Mm -hmm. And because he read law, he's, um, <laughs> one can say he's a lawyer, mm -hmm. I think he should be able to advise the government better when it comes to the whole issue with Sabali. Um, you know, extending his detention um, for another 10 days beyond 72 hours is really a violation of the Constitution. And it's a, it's a shame that, you know, him of all people, especially someone who was with National Council for Civic Education, mm -hmm. you know, talking about, you know, civic responsibility, civic rights and all that, you know, it's the same person who is in government today trying to do this. I mean, it's unfortunate. And treason, when they talk about treason, I mean, for me, my understanding will be when you probably take off take up arms against the government. Mm -hmm. and that could be treason. That's a yeah. treasonable offense. But this was just a mere political statement and you want to charge it with prison. I want to believe that. I'm not a lawyer, but I want to believe that 
Um, this is a well calculated move. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily going to put Sabali, I mean, sentence Sabali. They probably know that mm -hmm. because this government is used to also losing cases. Um, and it's a shame that the government is frequently losing cases. Mm -hmm. But all that they know is that probably, look, you know the what? judiciary has also been praised for, you know. Ex exactly, yeah. exactly. Judiciary has been praised for. But at some point, yeah. especially, I think in, in, if you look at the whole judiciary setup, might not be the problem. The mm -hmm. independence, people who have trust in them. But, you know, having, you know, elements of judges Within. who are probably probably doing t things deliberate, especially mm -hmm. if they want to go against somebody, a political, um, you know, opponent. Um, that is that is the problem here. So they might know that, look, you know what, we can't get anything against him, but let's put him behind bars, charge him for treason, that's not bailable. Mm -hmm. He'll be in mile two, yeah. um, few months. He's and since they are linking adjoining, into the local government, a local government adjoining, maybe it passed. Ad adjoining on all yeah. that, and then at the end of the day, you know, we let him go because the state might not have anything concrete against him to, to be able to jail him. But it's a violation of somebody's fundamental rights and freedoms, and this is not what we fought for as a country when we changed government. And that is why today I, I want to say this. Um, we have to start holding... Mm -hmm our politicians to account, especially those that we are in, we are, we are in government. Um, these are laws that we all insulted the Ajame for. We said he brought in, you know, these bad laws. Mm -hmm. You know, Hamad Ba was in opposition from 1996 to you know, to, to, um, to 2016, um, he'd been talking about these bad laws. Hussein Dabo was in opposition from 1996 to 2016, talking about these bad laws, mm -hmm. even though for him, he challenged the, um, you know, the, um, the Public Order Act, yeah. the judiciary was able to, you know, um, you know, rule against it, but, you know, they were in government as well, and of course, especially his party had a, a good number in parliament. Mm -hmm. um, these laws could have been changed. O.J. Jalo was also in opposition. Um, throughout the Jaime time, um, the Maifatis, who yeah. was in fact the interior minister at the time, and this public order act was operating. Um, you know, you get the likes of Henry Gomez. All these people came and made us believe that the laws were bad in this country and we need to change the laws. But they were in government. Um, Adam Abaro himself, being in opposition, mm -hmm. um, being in a party that had suffered the most among all opposition parties in this country in terms of brutalities, mm -hmm. uh, because those bad laws were being used. So you cannot come to power today being Minister of Tourism and Culture, being Minister of Foreign Affairs, Vice President, being Minister of Agriculture, being Minister of Interior, um, being Minister of um, Youth and Sports, that's Henry. I mean, occupying these very important positions, and of course having members in Parliament, all these political parties, mm -hmm. you know, UDP had 31, mm -hmm. NRP had um, 4 or 5, you know, you get the PPP also have at least 2 or 3, do you understand? I mean, all of them in government, literally, in the legislature, in the executive and at some point at some point even the judiciary mm -hmm. having all these people there at the end of the day we still have these laws in the country it's a shame like i've always said it's a shame that we have um you know barrow sworn in again for the second time using the 1997 constitution we we've conducted um one presidential election and two mm -hmm. parliamentary elections mm -hmm. using the 1997 constitution after the ajame left this country mm -hmm. using the same electoral law the same public order act is in place all those terrible laws media repressive media laws are Jack also Onion still in place laws, yeah. um so it's really it's really um very disappointing that these laws are still in place um, because the politicians are supposed to change these laws have failed to change them and now it is here to hunt everybody unfortunately thank you very much for coming yes sir you're welcome thank you very much uh, viewers and then have a good day